Senwa finds a unique courage to keep pushing forwards on her quest, no matter what. She sees the world differently to those around her and faces challenges others would avoid. When driven so strongly by one powerful purpose, she will do anything to rid the world of the darkness. This is her life's mission, and she will not stop until she fulfills her quest. My name is Eddie, and I have lived with psychosis for most of my life. To me, psychosis means living in a different reality. Uh, a reality that isn't shared with other people. Uh, often living with psychosis is dark and miserable. While experiencing psychosis, I've got to hear the voice of God, the opposite, uh, seen and spoken with angels, and been to hell itself. Recovery College and peer support really did turn my life around. I thought I would never get better, and yet here I am. The things that Senua experiences in Hellblaze are very similar to some of my own experiences. Uh, she lives in a reality that uh, other people might find hard to understand. Uh, she sees significance in symbols, in meeting people, in all sorts of things that are going on around her. Senua is experiencing an altered state of reality, which would be very hard to understand without having experienced it yourself or playing Hellblade. A lost soul who fought through hell to find us. You were lost. Not anymore. Oh. Are you ready for what you will find here? It's difficult saying that it's uh, an illness, that it's not real. Of course, to me, it is. And of course, to Senua, it is. And that's what's driving her to do these amazing feats of courage to overcome pain and exhaustion, to do what she knows she must. Everything I've done has led me to this place. We've come so far. Not far enough. Say it. You are ready to tell them. In Senua's saga Hellblade 2, we tell the second part of the story of Senua, the Celtic warrior who, like Eddie, has experiences of psychosis, seeing the world in a unique way and existing in a reality unshared by others. At a surface level, this manifests for Senua in seeing things that others don't, hearing things that others don't, and having unique beliefs about the world. My name's Paul Fletcher. I'm a psychiatrist and a professor of neuroscience at the University of Cambridge, and I've been working with the Ninja Theory team on Hellblade and other projects for several years now. I am a clinical doctor, um, but have also added research and teaching to my role. And in all three areas, I'm especially interested in the human brain and how it strives to make sense of the world, um, which is complex and changing all the time. The lake, like a mirror, you can see the reflection. Senua, like many people, experiences psychosis. Now, psychosis is not a diagnosis, although it is associated with a number of medical and psychiatric conditions. But ultimately, it's a loose description of a shift in one's experience of reality. What are you doing? Screams of the dead. There's something here. They are not I need to find out what it is. They are. A person with psychosis might experience changes in their perceptions and their beliefs. For example, they might see or hear things that other people can't. 
and they might come to believe things that are quite uncharacteristic for them. For example, they might feel that somebody, perhaps somebody even very close to them, is intent on trying to harm them. Now, it's, it's very important to remember that this is not just a vague feeling or an imagination. To the person, it feels like their reality, just as everything around me feels like my reality to me. I, like many people, feel that in order to even begin to understand psychosis, we have to start with thinking about how the brain works in general, how it um, makes sense of the world around it. And when we do that, we're repeatedly confronted with evidence that actually it doesn't just rely on the evidence of our senses, but it actually relies on what it already knows, on its predictions, its anticipations and its expectations. Now that might seem like a defect. After all, why would we want to um, rely on what we already know rather than what the world is telling us? But if we did act simply as passive receivers, um, we would be completely swamped. We'd be like a newborn infant trying to make sense of the colours and shapes without any way of, of having a framework to try and understand that, those uh, colours and shapes. Our senses are bombarded with information from the world that's rapid, it's intensive, it is noisy, ambiguous, unreliable. And if we were try to try and make sense of that without imposing patterns that, and expectations, then it would be like trying to assemble a multi-dimensional jigsaw without knowing what the picture was on the box. Many of us think that the brain ultimately is an organ that makes predictions. Um, it craves patterns and associations in order to make sense of the world. And without that, um, we are confronted with a feeling of uncertainty, of anxiety, of distress, even of fear. They're calling. Something is drawing down. Where do these predictions come from? Many of them are actually embedded in the structure of our brain, probably wired there by evolution. Many of them come from our earliest experiences as babies, trying to make sense of this new world that we're born into. Many come from our early childhood experiences, from what we learn from others and how we interact with others, from our parents, our teachers, our friends. We all have a feeling that we're directly in contact with an object of reality. But it's probably the case that what we experience as our constructed model of the world is a blend of the evidence of our senses, but also what we are predicting or expecting from, from the world. So this blend exists in a very fine and delicate balance, and, and the weighting of that balance probably varies a great deal across different individuals. But crucially, this balance is what determines how we experience and interpret and act upon the world. And some of them are embedded in shared experiences with others, our society, our culture, our arts, even our religions and our mythologies. So for the most part, this works very well for us and enables us to make sense of the world, but it's also being a delicate balance, it can be shifted and it's very easy, even under the most normal day-to-day -day circumstances, to deviate from objective reality. A good example of this is the hollow mask illusion. All of us are familiar with, an, with a mask, we know that it depicts a face and that the inside is hollow. But when we see the mask rotating round and we see the hollow side, there is a deeper prediction, probably embedded in our brain, that uh, facial features tend not to be hollow, that they stick out. And this deeper prediction can override our knowledge that the mask is hollow and make us actually perceive the face as sticking out at us. Despite what we, we know, the deeper predictions will override this. So for me and many in my field, perceptual illusions like this, which are very common, 
are really interesting because they tell us something fundamentally about how the brain is making sense of reality using its predictions. But more than that, for me, it's very interesting because it begins to give us a sense of how psychosis might begin to emerge. The psychosis is this experience of an altered internal construction of one's reality. And it seems feasible that this is dependent upon this balance I've talked about between predictions and evidence. And it is probably the case that some people tend to weight their predictions more heavily. This, in many circumstances, is advantageous because it means that they can discern patterns and associations that perhaps other people can't. But if that balance was shifted further uh, by different circumstances, then it may well be that they begin to construct a reality that doesn't accord with the world around them. What might cause that shift? Well, a number of things. It could be caused by stress, sleep deprivation. It could be caused, be caused by... Um, illness, neurochemical disturbances. It's also the case that um, our experience will change how we predict things. So a very profound experience, for example, of trauma could powerfully change the way in which we make predictions about the world and shift us uh, from this delicate balance into a state of psychosis. In the case of Senua, we know that from an early age she was able to discern patterns and associations that perhaps other people couldn't. And on top of that, her childhood and adolescence had a number of traumas in it. Her father was abusive and he accused her of being the cause of evil and darkness. Her mother, who had the same capabilities as she did, was actually sacrificed for the same reason. And in addition, her village was uh, attacked by Vikings and her lover was brutally killed. And it's possible that all of these traumas would act on her natural tendencies to topple her into this psychotic experience that is depicted in Hellblade. With every defeat, the dark rot will grow and soon it will take her soul. In Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, we find Senua discovering and understanding her experiences. They're relatively new to her and the pain and torment feels at its most acute. Having travelled to a new place with a mind full of her trauma and Drew's stories of the Vikings, she embarks on a journey of coming to terms with what has happened in her life. Ultimately, rather than finding the unachievable certainty of rescuing Dillian, she achieves certainty in the realisation that Dillian is gone forever. She learns to accept his death and in turn, her experiences of psychosis. Even in darkness, the wonder and the beauty of this world never leaves us. It is always there, waiting to... In Senua Saga, we find Senua at a different place on her physical and mental journey. Empowered with the sense that she has overcome her own darkness, she's now compelled to follow a new quest to save her people from that same darkness. You smell their food. No death. He's here. Death is coming. Look at the bones. Death is coming for Look at you. the bones. That's going to be you. <gasps> That's going to be yeah. everyone. In Sacrifice, Senua's psychosis is acute and all-consuming. She is preoccupied and absorbed by her experiences. To some extent, she is enveloped and enslaved by the, the darkness. She um, cannot ignore her voices and visions. She's totally committed to the quest within her altered reality. In Saga, there has been some resolution to this. There's no miracle recovery. She still experiences the voices and visions. She still has a changed reality. But the balance of power has shifted. She is the one who is able to be in control. She's able to resist and challenge the voices. She's able to make decisions that much more clearly reflect her own goals. Senuas, would you give your life for these outsiders? In my darkest hour, it was an outsider who saved me. And in addition, in Saga, 
she is able to encompass the reality of others. Uh, she sees them for the constructions that they are and she is able to interact with them and I think that's a very powerful change and a very important area to explore. They have lost everything. In Saga, we've had the opportunity to explore the next phase of Senua's mental health journey. One where she's come to a place of understanding, but where she and us as creators have new challenges to overcome. Where Senua's belief system will clash with that of others. Her experiences will play out in the presence of people who don't share her perspective. And where she feels a new sense of power in being chosen for the quest, but also a new weakness, bowing underneath the weight of responsibility that sits on her shoulders. Wait. In Saga, we have once again utilized binaural audio to bring Senua's voices to life. Her furies still travel with her, but their tone has changed this time. She continues to be haunted by her father and she starts to feel the audio presence of Icelandic myth infecting her mind. That scream, that voice. Something dark, Senua. You need to go up there. Don't let them see you coming. You need to find out. Don't let the monsters find you. You can do this, Senua. To hear the world that Senua does, we spend time with people with lived experiences of psychosis and also with Paul Fletcher. This made a strong basis of what it is to hear voices, what they say, how they sound, how they change or react to external stimulus. And this pair with all we learned from the first game, Hellblade Senua Sacrifice, led us to create Senua own sonic version of reality. To me, it's a privilege to sit in a room to play our game and as we progress, hear their comments, thoughts and suggestions. Each one provides a different perspective and I find especially inspiring and humbling to hear from Eddie his own experiences. Especially, I find he has a way of putting very complex emotions, situations, in a very simple yet poetic way. And it's really inspiring for me when I'm thinking in Senna's journey. We use binaural audio to bring 3D space in the headphones. This allows to experience the voice hearing and other sounds with a physical sense. Also extremely important is the performance of the voices. And for that, we have been collaborating with Helen and Abby, our Furies. They are the most prominent voices of Senua. The way we perform is important as well, allowing for freedom, movement, creative input from Helen and Abby, and also important to have with them conversation and spend time talking about the journey of our character. There is a lot of time gone into experimentation, so every sound in the game is connected in some way with the emotion that Senua is experiencing as she travels through Iceland, from the sounds of the nature to some of the musical moments. What? A sign. Beyond of its uniqueness or not, I find that for me, something extremely important is to create a connection beyond the game, so in understanding Senua's own reality and going on a journey with her, I hope our players will understand better how people experience reality different. And in doing so, I feel we break those walls that keep us distant and lonely. My brothers used to come here to practice fighting. Sneak out. Follow them. For Saga, in order to bring Senua's experiences of hallucinations to life, it was very important for us to listen to people's real lived experiences. It was then a case of thinking about how Senua's world and reality might look when faced with these types of examples. This would have been impossible without Paul Fletcher and amazing people like Eddie and Kathy, who've been so open and honest about what they have been and do go through on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it takes real strength to be able to talk about such personal things to a new group of people. On the visual side, we have lent into things like repeating fractal geometry shapes, cymatic patterns, with lighting and post-processing changes to all help reflect the current feelings of Senua. And hopefully, when combined with the audio and gameplay, the player will get a sense of what we are aiming to achieve. Dying right before your eyes, just 
shot before. No, this cannot happen again. You couldn't do anything. We have to stop it happening. Face it. You need to face it. Focus. Look at it. In Sacrifice, we saw a story of Senua's suffering at the hands of her experiences. In Saga, we're telling a more nuanced story of the next step on her journey. One where she has found a greater balance, but where her experiences are just as strong. Where rather than being a victim to her experiences of psychosis, she is driven by them on a path that only she sees. Bringing sin with you. The gods cannot be killed. One thing that I find very exciting in Saga is that there's an attempt to explore something that is really neglected in my field, which is the experience of a dual reality that some people have. People who have had Senua's types of experience have spoken to me about this feeling that they have their own reality, but they also recognize the reality that others experience. And it can be very confusing, it can be disorientating, and it's exciting to me that the game contains a, an explicit attempt to portray this experience of dual realities and I think it'll be very interesting to see how people respond to that. It's amazing what, what has been done and what, what's been portrayed. I think it's really difficult to turn words into what other people might be seeing but I think it's, I'm always blown away by what Ninja Theory come up with for their games and I'm re really stunned at the quality of, you know, the, the things that she sees and, um, and the sounds of, of the voices that she has. Um, I think they're pretty realistic. She's getting closer. Yes, she can feel it. I hope that the game will help people who maybe don't understand psychosis or don't know very much about it to start with. I think by experiencing some of what they will do in the game, I think it brings to life a little bit of what it's like to have psychosis and I think hopefully people will learn from it. Now I'm working as a peer support worker and what that means is that I, in my case, in, in, in the job that I have in my role, it means that I go to see my people, to see my peers. We talk about how things have been, the way that Hellblade has captured the experience of psychosis is nothing like I've ever seen before in terms of its realism, in terms of its uh, fairness to people like me.